202 of the Church Bibles. Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house, if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. So, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me and for 40 years saw what I did. This is why I was angry with that generation. And I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he hang angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. This is the word of the Lord. Good evening, everybody, as we're looking through this uh, series from the book of Hebrews. But uh, it's quite a tough word, that, wasn't it? it it's, uh, you know, it's a challenging passage, so let's, uh, let's pray that we take it, uh, we take it to heart in, in, the right, in the right kind of way. So, Lord, as we, we look at this passage tonight, we, we just ask that you would lead us, guide us through it. Take us to those parts, Lord, where you're telling us, um, you know, there are things in our lives that we might need to change. We might need to rely on you more and more. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we, we are three weeks into our series from the book of Hebrews, where we've been using as a kind of an overall, an overarching theme, the supremacy of Jesus. And in the previous two chapters, we've looked at Jesus, superior to the Old Testament prophets. And then a bit later, we looked at Jesus, superior to the angelic powers, to the angelic orders. And tonight, we're going to look at the whole of chapter three uh, under the title, I've just called it Jesus, more glorious than Moses. And it might help if you have your Bibles ready. We'll be kind of dotting around a bit in other books outside of Hebrews. So uh, um, please, please do, please do look at your Bibles. Note the way this chapter begins. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling. And that simple opening word, therefore, you know, what's it there for? And I have to take you back to the conclusions of Toulouse talk last week. That's what it's going back to in the light of everything that Toulouse shared last Sunday evening. Salvation belongs to our God and in Jesus, our God has come in the flesh. 
So in the light of all that, we, we enter chapters three, chapter three, uh, the whole 19 verses we're looking at. And I want to speak to three themes tonight that are going to be common recurring themes through the whole book of Hebrews, all 13 or so chapters. And um, I've, I've broken it down into, into three areas. The first one is um, the theme that we've already picked up, the superiority of Jesus. And it's this thing about Jesus versus Moses tonight. That's the, the first six verses. The biggest part of the text, I've just entitled that warnings, warnings about unbelief, warnings taken from that Moses wilderness generation. And that's two blocks, verses 7, 11, and also it's recapitulated in uh, verses 15 through to 19. And then finally, some encouragement at the end, encouragement to persevere in the faith. So I've just called that perseverance through preservation, those three verses, 12 through to 14. So let's look at Jesus, superior, superior to Moses. Remember that opening verse, consider Jesus, it says, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. Now, the book of Hebrews has got loads of titles for Jesus. We come across di different ones in different chapters, but um, two titles there. The first one is unusual. Jesus is called our apostle. I believe that's the only time in Scripture that Jesus is ever given that title. Apostle just simply means one who is sent. And in the light of that, Jesus is the ultimate sent one, sent by God on that, um, that, that uh, quest for our salvation. Later on, Jesus would call the 12 apostles and send them out into their ministry. But he did that because he was the first apostle. And the other, the other title is Jesus, our high priest, the one who offers the sacrifice for our sin, our rebellion, opens the path to reconciliation between God and man. But also he's the one that's constantly interceding on behalf of his people. I'm not going to major on that because uh, that will become a, a, a big topic in chapters four and chapter seven later on. So with those two titles in mind and that the scene is set in the next five verses to consider Jesus' uh, superiority over Moses and how is that expressed? First thing, what what really, what is the big deal? What is the big deal about Moses, really? Remember, Hebrews is addressed almost certainly to a mainly Jewish Christian audience, if I can put it like that. Converts from the Jewish faith, from the Judaism of the first century, where along with Abraham, Moses and Abraham, they occupied such a, a prime position, a, a key position in the Jewish heart. After all, Moses was the one that led the Israelites out of Egypt in the Exodus. Such a crucial moment that in the story of God's people, he was there when he met God on Mount Sinai and, 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 and received the law, the Ten Commandments. Moses is also the author of the first five books of our Old Testament, Genesis to Deuteronomy, so foundational for our Christian faith. So yes, he is a big deal. He is a major pillar of the Jewish faith. And yet Jesus is more glorious still as the writer unfolds the reasons why in verses two through to six. He starts off initially actually by praising Moses. He says Jesus was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. So the two of them, Jesus and Moses, were both faithful servants in God's house. But Christ's superiority emerges in the way that he fulfills all that Moses pointed towards. He was the fulfillment of everything Moses uh, stood for. So 
Jesus over Jesus over Moses. Sorry, I'm 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 getting ahead of myself here in PowerPoints. Jesus, um, Jesus over Moses. First thing, two reasons we are given here. The first is that Jesus is greater than Moses because he is the builder of God's house. Verses three, three, um, three to four. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than um, greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. For God's house, don't think of the building, think of God's people. Moses was a very honorable part of God's people, his Old Testament people. Um, but Jesus, he's the cornerstone. He's the uniquely the creator, the builder. So that's one big difference. The other one is Jesus is greater in status. Verse five, Moses was faithful as a servant in God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. That's pointing towards Jesus, but Christ is faithful as God's son over God's house. It's the difference between a servant and a son. The son inherits, basically. He owns the house. He's lord over the house and provides for those in the house, including his servants. So just as, as, as Jesus was God's son, faithful as God's son over God's people, we conclude that he, in every way, is greater than Moses. And then there's a challenge at the very end of that section, a challenge to hold fast, not, not to Moses, but to Jesus. And it goes on to say, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. It's a little bit of a condition in there. It's a conditional thought. And with that verse, we transition into the next block of teaching, the warnings about unbelief. And in these 10, 10 verses, there's a, a comparison going on. On the one hand, between the audience who, were, who have received the book of Hebrews, the readers of the book of Hebrews, set against the Exodus generation that Moses was leading out of Egypt into the, the wilderness. And these verses, they, they actually comprise one of five so-called blocks of or, or warning passages. And their purpose is really to, 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 to shock us, to shock us from about that dreadful uh, consequence of drifting away from the faith, which you, if you remember back in our introduction in chapter one, some of the Hebrew congregation were in danger of doing that very thing. They were in danger of drifting back into, back into their, their, their Old Testament religion because it, it, it was a safer prospect for them to do that. And that's a terrible danger for them because they are running the risk of committing that terrible sin of, of, of what the Bible calls apostasy, like a falling away completely from the faith. We get a good flavor of how the, the writer confronts this danger from verses 7 onwards, verses 7 to 11, which if, if you look at your footnotes in the Bible, it tells you it's actually a direct quote from Psalm 95, uh, verses 7 to 11. And as I read these words, any prayer book Anglicans among you will uh, recognize it, no doubt, as the Vanity. <laughs> yeah, Michael's nodding, yeah. <laughs> Let's read some of it. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said their hearts are always going astray. They have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. So under the leadership of Moses, they'd been 
very graciously delivered from Egyptian slavery through a whole series of of God appointments, of divine intervention, the 10 plagues, if you remember, which kind of set the ball rolling. Then there was the Passover, the deliverance through the parting of the Red Sea, the miraculous provisions in the wilderness. And they were heading towards Canaan, God's, the promised land of, of God's rest. And they were just on the verge of entry, but they failed at the crucial moment through fear, through unbelief, as we'll see. And that second block of verses that I mentioned in 16, 15, 16 through to 19, it just gives you a whole sort of catalogue of things that were going on that showed how this wilderness generation was so unfaithful. In verse 16, they heard God's voice through Moses, yet they still rebelled. Verse 17, it talked about them deliberately going against God, sinning against God. Verse 18, they were disobedient to his call. And then in verse 19, probably the saddest indictment of them all, they were unbelieving. Spiritual hardness. It's a terrible thing. It's a dangerous thing. For, the, for that generation, it started off with grumbling. And yet it progressed all the way through to sheer unbelief. And as a result, you know, God lost it with that generation, declared his anger against them. Many would not enter the promised land, including, including Moses. It would be left to the next generation under faithful Joshua and Caleb to reap the benefits of Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey. And it's with this sad story of Israel's rebellion as backdrop that verse 12 of our chapter issues a clear warning to its own congregation. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you have a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. It's that hardness, that hard stony heart that he is that he is warning against and i said it's a, a tough message basically he's saying that some members of the church family to which hebrews is addressed are acting just like that wilderness generation they're playing with fire they're thinking they think they can kind of dra- you know drift back into their former ways under judaism without any consequences but to do so would be to commit that sin of apostasy, falling away. And that, in the end, leads to eternal separation from the living God. And that is a frightening prospect. How, how, how would they react to such a message? How do we react <laughs> as recipients of the same message? You know, it's speaking to us tonight in the same way. I guess we really need to ask what part these warning verses are playing in the overall storyline of Hebrews. What are they saying to us as followers of Jesus today? I say that, I need to digress a little bit here, but because some Christians down the centuries have concluded from these verses, plus some others in Hebrews, that kind of a, a terminal falling away from the faith in Jesus, ultimately losing our salvation is being spoken of here. And for the sensitive soul, that has devastating, devastating consequences for any assurance of faith. So here's how I would handle that tricky question. And that's going to lead on to this next section where, 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 where we look at those warning passages against the more positive encouragements and exhortations that come in verses 12, 12 through 14. Let me say up front, I cannot believe that a true, genuine disciple of Jesus can wander so far from the faith as to lose their initial salvation. I know not every Christian would kind of agree with that, but um, I honestly think that that the, the genuine Christian 
might backslide, might grow through periods of doubt and disobedience, but behind it all is the preserving hand of God's faithfulness, kind of bringing them back on track, as it were, getting them past the finishing post. Hence that phrase, perseverance, through God's preservation. And to be honest, there are many verses in the Bible, I think, that, that spell out the idea that, that of our eternal security, that once we've been genuinely born of the Spirit, we've been justified by faith in Jesus, we, we will be kept safe through to the end. After all, Jesus, the, the good shepherd, promised as much, didn't he, in John chapter 10? My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one, no one, and it's really emphatic, no one will snatch them out of my hands. That's, that's straight from Jesus. Or if we switch to St. Paul, many, many verses there. And that's Romans chapter 8. I think that's the, the famous one, though. That, those famous verses 29 and 30, the golden chain of salvation, which talks about God's kind of electing foreknowledge at the beginning, which leads all the way through to us coming to faith, being justified, and goes all the way through to our final glorification. And it's like a seamless, it's like a seamless unbreakable chain. What, what God begins, he will complete. And that's exactly what Paul said to the Philippian Christians. God, who has begun a good work in us, will carry it on until the day of Jesus Christ. And that's why I think when you line up verses like this, um, and that I, I come to the conclusion that I, I could never really doubt that God will let us down. <laughs> you know, he will get us, he will get us there to the end. And that if we, you know, are, are genuinely born again of God's spirit. So that's the view from above, so to speak, from God's perspective, his providential control over our lives through the good times, but, you know, as Tolu was sharing, but also through the bad times, the not so good times as well. But practically for us on the ground, this is like the view from down below, the means for us reaching that final salvation is our ongoing perseverance in faith. Verse 14, we have come to share in Christ. That's a past tense, going back to our conversion. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. The latter is the proof of the former. In other words, true saints will receive that final commendation, that final salvation, but the means of getting there is by us persevering in faith, remembering that that perseverance is undergirded by God's preserving hand. It's enabled by his spirit. And that, I believe, is, is the pattern, the, the biblical pattern, perseverance through preservation. Okay, just to get back to Hebrews 3, on, on the back of what I've just said about that preservation, uh, what we must do is, is read these warning passages in chapter 3 alongside the encouragements, the exhortations to, to faith in verses 12 and 13. And I see two applications here, two takeaways tonight, which I think flow from, from these verses. The first one, that, that the warnings are to the Christian a means to our ongoing salvation. Going back to verse 12. Take heed, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. It's like the warning sign on that, um, on that, pow on that PowerPoint there. It's a message shouting, you, you know, danger, danger ahead. Watch out, watch out how are you behaving. Watch out. You see, there are all kinds of alternative passions are, are making war on our souls all the time. 
every day tempting us one way and another, trying to, to derail our faith in Jesus and replace him with, you know, lots of other false treasures and, and idols. And that means for, for genuine Christians, these warnings become the means that God pulls us up short when we are going down that road of trifling with sin and disobedience. They help preserve us in faith and put us back on track, back on that true path again when we, you know, we might be tempted to stray from it. So that's one of the things. They are a means. The warnings are a means to salvation. You might call it God's tough love, if you like, but I think we should treat them as friends. The other thing, the other thing, the other second takeaway message, I've, um, I've just called it this, eternal security is a community project. Some of you might recognize that as one of John Piper's very pithy stayings, pithy sayings, I mean, <laughs> I should say. So we read in verse 13, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Basically, it's saying we need each other. We need to regularly exhort to encourage one another to keep on going, to persevere in faith, through those good times and bad, to hold fast to the truth we have in Jesus, not give up on it, not compromise it in any way. And there are so many ways we can do that on a Sunday in church, through the teaching, through the worship, through the fellowship. But I'm thinking especially of, of, of times as well when we can meet in smaller groups. That's why our life group systems are, are so kind of key, so crucial to, to fellowship, our small group ministries. But maybe, maybe not just light group, maybe you're in a prayer triplet or just simply when you have one-on-one -on -one informal just conversations with somebody over a, a cup of coffee. In fact, later on in... Hebrews are such a, a powerful reminder for believers to do just this very thing, to encourage one another. And I'll just put that, I'll end with this thought tonight. Let us not neglect, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So you might say, well, I'm not quite seeing, seeing um, the idea of Christian fellowship, Christian community quite like that, but we are God's appointed means of helping one another to persevere, to, to, to you know, not fall away from the faith, and that's why we fight. That's why we fight to encourage one another's faith by speaking words that, Point to the truth of Jesus. You know, he's our prize. He's our greatest pressure, uh, uh, treasure. By arming one another with those reasons why he's more to be trusted, more desired than, than anything else. And I think that is a, an amazing privilege on which to end our look through Hebrews chapter 3 tonight. Eternal security. Our eternal security is a community project. Next Sunday, Pam has the task of taking on chapter four of Hebrews and the promise of entering God's Sabbath rest. But um, let's pray and I'll, then I'll hand back to, uh, to, to Tulu. Father, we thank you for the challenges of this passage, the, the sometimes tough love that comes over in the Bible, but, you know, we thank you that you are a great God. You are, as Jill said earlier, you are bigger than we can ever imagine, that you are that good, good Father that promises to preserve us through to the end. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Dave.